Whoops. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Anytime. Anytime. Okay. Hello. My name is Elaine Mattingly. I am here with Dr. Rosina Bakari, and we are here today to talk about an idea, a theory, a book, something you're all going to want to roll around in, think about, understand, share with your friends, and that idea is a theory known as gene pooling. And it is advanced by Dr. Rosita Bakari here in a book she recently published called Original Sin, Understanding the Movement Towards Female Agency. Okay, I know that sounds a little lofty, but not to worry. She's going to break it down here real quick when I get done talking. But first, I just want to lay a little bit of groundwork for her because she's going to go to town on these concepts. Um, and the book is called, first of all, Original Sin. Because, as I understand it, Dr. Bakari, you are directly challenging all the tr traditional interpretations of original sin. Is that not right? That's correct. Okay. Particularly regarding this new theory she's advancing, gene pooling. Uh, she's asserting, now wait for it, this may seem a little provocative, but we got to talk about this, people. we got to talk. Original sin is rape. Rape. That's a four-letter word. She's going to break it down. She's going to talk about it. Then she's going to talk about how once rape occurred in the world because basically at one point in time there had to be a first rape. Okay? You know? And that, and she, and Dr. Bakari asserts that all human interactions changed after the introduction of this particular four-letter word. Not a <laughs> four-letter word. Um, Anyway, then because of the introduction of rape, uh, she asserts that males became both predators and protectors, and that changed all manner of human interactions. Only makes sense, right? Can you imagine a rape-free existence? I'd like to imagine that. I think Dr. Bakari would like to imagine that, and she's going to talk about it. And then she also talks about that the only way to reduce conflict is for women to be free, another fabulous four-letter word. And so I am really interested in hearing more about the gene pooling theory, and I hope you are too. And Dr. Bakari, would you please tell us about this original sin thing, this gene pooling thing, all these concepts that are packed in this one tiny little book here. Thank you, Elaine. Well, the idea of gene pooling suggests that the theory of evolution and traditional theories of religion both begin exploring the world post what we might be considering now a uh, male dominance paradigm, which means uh, post once males basically became in charge of everything in the world. And so uh, that leaves us with a very different impression of the world, one that suggests that that's all there ever was, was men being in charge of the world. In fact, if you uh, go around and talk to people, they'll simply tell you that's just the way it's always been. Men have always been in charge or because they're stronger and bigger and have more muscles, that sort of nonsense. Um, and so what the gene pool theory suggests is that the male dominance paradigm is equivalent to what I consider uh, gene pooling. So the idea that there was actually a time before that where males and females were equal before rape, as you already uh, uh, mentioned to, as I discussed in the book. So before rape, men and women both could fend for themselves. So after rape occurred in the world, then men, as you say, stated already, became the, the protectors of females because females are so valued in the world because without them, you can't get life anywhere. You can't, you can't advance life without females. Children have to be born uh, in the womb. Uh, and, so be, and so females are very much in charge of the selection process in terms of humanity. So that means if females don't select the male, their genes don't get passed down. 
Okay, this is big people. This is a very huge concept right here. This whole idea that women were actually in charge of their own reproduction, their own capacity to reproduce, and that with the introduction of rape, that that changed the whole paradigm. And we are experiencing that now. Is that what you're saying? We're left with the ramifications of that. Correct. And you're trying to unpack this whole journey that we've taken. Yes, you got it. So, so once rape occurred, then men had no choice but to become the protectors of females. It's interesting that to think that males, men, have always been the most dangerous predator to women. Even to this day, they were more dangerous. We haven't, there's no history that show us that we had to fear dinosaurs or alligators or whatever because they were just coming up and eating us. No, but we know since time, since we can remember in this time that we have feared men post rape. That wasn't how it was supposed to be. It wasn't always that way. So there's domestic violence. Yes. There's uh, property. Uh, you know, these whole systems of, of ways men have sought to uh, dominate right. women as a result of this. So Correct. we're left with, the, we're left, so that's a whole topic unto itself. Correct. You know. So there's more to the theory though. Yes. So, so once rape is introduced, man has to now become protector. Well, we know that the way that we protect our children, uh, if I am your protector, if your life depends on me, we're not equal. Uh -huh. There are things that I do to protect my children, right? So what are the kind of things that we do when we have to protect someone? Then we keep them indoors more. We, we uh, help them avoid dangerous situations, et cetera, et cetera. So we, in fact, restrict their being in the world when we become their, when we become their for as long as we are their protectors. Then some feminists would point to this notion of the pi private versus the public sphere of women operating in the world. So there you go. Keep her inside. Absolutely. Keep her private. She's Absolutely. A, so a woman is for private use, private objectification as you were, as is another word that comes up. Right. Um, but I want to avoid that word for just a minute because, uh -oh. only because, um, as the, the theory goes, I believe that women agree to this system in the beginning. Uh, uh, when once rape was introduced and females knew that they needed to be protected from these males and males knew that they needed to be protected, um, w w females needed to be protected from these males, I believe it was a sensible agreement, right, between men and women. One of the things that we know that anytime messages have to get passed down through generation and generation and generation, that message often gets weaker and weaker and weaker. So where we may have started out as equal um, to males and entered into this agreement in a way that had us equal to males still, that we need women to be protected and not raped. Um, as the messages got along, because we, we begin to separate in terms of equality, right? Because men now have the edge because this danger has been introduced in the world that literally threatens humanity if females all die off because they are trying to fight themselves off from males, then we wouldn't be here today. And so it was in our, mm -hmm. it was in our best interest to cooperate. And so we entered into this agreement. Um, what happened, though, I believe over, over thousands and thousands of years, we're not talking about a generation. We're talking about many, many, many generations, and it gets watered down from women becoming, um, so, and, um, from males becoming the protector of females to males, we know it turned into males becoming the owner of females. And so there's this whole process by which just little movements, like the once rape happened, that changed things. And then once somebody decided, okay, now that we have to protect females, we're going to treat them this exactly. way. Exactly. And then we're going to do this thing right. out of that notion of protection, which also, as you had kind of said previously, that also the notion of men vying for women in order to procreate, right. so to protect their turf. Right. So but, women is a turf then. But right, as a result. But here, here's the biggest change that occurred. This is huge. So before rape, females, as we talked about, were in charge of the gene pool due, due to selection. What happens once men become our protectors and all those things start to snowball into how women are treated, over, over time in that transition, 
there's a point where men now become in charge of the gene pool. That's huge. So now women no longer select. Why? Because men are now taking their daughters and their wives and selling them, telling them who they can procreate with uh, and all this other nonsense. And so once... Arranged marriages, uh, yes. all that sort of stuff. Um, Sex, slavery, slavery, all that stuff. And so for, for thousands of years, it's been thousands of years now since women have been in charge of the gene pool which is, has been our evolutionary uh, governance, if you will, right? To control the gene pool, to make decisions based on whose gene belong in the gene pool. So, but there have been glimpses, like in the last 30 years, of what it would mean if we were to try to reclaim our power. There are glimpses, yes. But, but th- that- there, there, there can only be glimpses until we really have a thorough understanding and really call it what it is and really know this isn't about sex and sexuality. It's sex and sexuality is included in that, mm-hmm. but really understanding the importance of taking back the gene pool so that we can get things on track. And so all the ways now that we reproduce are based in dysfunction. Okay, now that's a big concept, yeah. or, or that's a major assertion. So what do you mean by all the ways we reproduce? So when women were in charge of the gene pool, and we certainly can't go back then because we've evolved and we have all these systems in place, et cetera, et cetera, we, we uh, presumably chose based on characteristics that we needed in the world, that were advancing in the world, things like kindness and generosity and, and um, cooperation sharing. Yeah. and sharing, yeah. Yeah. those sorts of things. And, and I'll leave that for a different conversation as to how we did that. But, and, but we were in charge. We, we looked at characteristics that, that we, in the same way that they do that in, a, in the animal world, and people have to choose it. We, and when you say choose. in charge at that point, that, that didn't mean that, right. And, but that didn't mean that you were, that there was dominance. And necessarily, no, because no, there was cooperation, right? And our, and our, it wasn't part, female dominance; no. it was cooperation. cooperation, right? And our part of that cooperation was selecting the mate. Mm-hmm. That was our part. That was our due diligence. Once we lost that ability to select mates, then we went really went downhill. Uh huh. Right? And so when we talk about taking back the gene pool, we're talking about having having to reinstitute all of our freedoms that were necessary to uphold the gene pool in the first place. We get to decide, for example, who we have children with, when we have children, how many children we have. All these things have been really stripped from us over these thousands of years. And until women can take back the gene pool by being fully free of fear, fear of rape, Fear of legal repercussions because you don't want to have children, or fear of scolding because you're 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 this age and you don't have children. When we can be free from fear of males dominating over our lives in physical ways, psychological ways, emotional ways, systemic ways, systemic ways, yes. <laughs> then until we can do that, then the world won't move nearly as quickly as it should in terms of restoring humanity. So we could talk about social justice, we could talk about war and peace and all these things, but when you, what you're asserting is that if we spiral that back to this notion of of, uh, uh, rape, original sin as being rape and everything that 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 has happened since then, the male dominance paradigm. So if we dial it back to, to that understanding, then we can, everything comes into place if we deal with that. Exactly. So what you're in terms, of, and when I say comes into place, what you mean is women are free to be fully human and authentic yes. on the planet. Yes, and as having, men would be, and having a major conscientious, conscious contribution to the gene pool. Okay. That's not warped. That's not taken. That's not warped in Remember. rape objectification, um, dehumanization, sex slavery. Uh, molestation, all these other warped manipulations, manipulations of okay. the gene pool. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. That's a good place to stop. Well, that was a lot. <laughs> and there's more coming from Dr. Rosina Bakari 
and you can get her book on Amazon.com and it's not a long read but you'll want to read it more than once because it's packed with every concept you can imagine to roll around in and ruminate on and it's important stuff because if we get back to the essence of a meaning of what she's really talking about it really does just pretty much impact everything that happens with humanity on the planet I know that's a bold statement but it's actually true and so it's really important that we all think deeply and consciously and Dr. Rosina Bakari is helping us with that with her book called Original Sin Understanding the Movement Toward Female Agency. Thank you Elaine. Thank you are you. welcome. <laughs>